Well, good morning, church. It's uh, it's a it's a blessing to be here this morning. Uh, it's always a I, I love the opportunities I get to be able to to bring the word. And I was I was really excited um, about being able to preach uh, today until David told me what I was preaching on. And so, uh, for those of you who already have skipped ahead, uh, he kind of said. You're going to preach on the Sixth Commandment. And he chuckled, and then he left. <laughs> and so, um, so the Sixth Commandment is simple today. So we're, I'm a, I, I, but as I've, as I've been looking through, I've found a little bit more, and I'm excited about, about what the Lord is going to uh, speak uh, through his word this morning. In, uh, on 60 Minutes years ago, uh, 60 Minutes did a story about a deacon who was on his way home from a church service, and as he was driving home, he saw two cars kind of fly by him in the left lane, and in the first car, there was a woman, and in the second car, there were two men. And as they were driving, uh, they had put their brights on high, and and they were closely following this woman, and, and just kind of really easing up close to, the, to her bumper, uh, driving too close, and she was trying to kind of get them off and speeding up and all that. They stayed right with her. Finally, she moved over and they took off. But the deacon saw that and he was upset. And so he got in the lane behind the two men and followed really close behind them. And he was, he was close. He turned his brights on and he stayed very close with them as well. They finally thought, well, we better get out of the way. So they moved to the middle lane and he moved to the middle lane behind them and stayed on with them. With the brights on high, or brights on, whatever, you don't have brights on high. Anyway, so uh, then after a few miles, then he, uh, they, he still was pursuing. So they moved over to the far right lane, and he moved over as well with his brights still on. Finally, they decided they were going to confront him. They pulled over to the side of the road, and the deacon followed as well. And when they got out of the car, they came out with a flashlight. He jumped out of the car, went around to the back to the trunk, and pulled out of his trunk a crossbow, a hunting crossbow, which with an arrow that upon impact, razor blades shot out and would cause damage. And he goes, and without a word, he goes and he shoots one of these guys, and it sliced through his aortic artery, and he bled out before the ambulance could arrive. 60 minutes then later, he's talking with this guy who's serving a life sentence in prison, and he was talking about this, and he says, no, I had to act. What they were doing was wrong, and I had, to, I, had to, I had to pay them back for what they were doing, for following a lady. Devastating disasters develop from surprisingly small starts. When we look at something like that, we think, well, how does it come to that? I, I don't think he woke up that morning and said, well, I'm going to go to a church service, and then later I'm going to kill someone. It's not that way that it works. But these, the devastation began long before that. And we're talking about this morning a command that has three words but has massive implications. It's actually a difficult command to look at. And the, it, it, one of the things, I think we all struggle with anger at one point or another. Everybody struggles with anger. And, it, and, and that often gets played out in contempt and, uh, and it sparks these little fits of anger or, or rage sometimes. And, and it goes beyond to extreme acts that we're going to talk about today. And so we want to look this morning at the, the command, not just the command, but we want to see beyond kind of the parameters around this command. Now, most people, when they look at this command, and probably many of you today as well, you look at this command, do not murder. Okay, that's the sixth command. Don't, you shall not murder. Simple enough. Most people check that box and they say, all right, I've been convicted on the other five up to this point. David said some good stuff. Uh, but, but, but now, uh, this one is one that I think I can just coast through. And I was thinking the same thing. A, a few weeks ago, I was talking with my wife about it. And I said, well, I, I'm not really quite sure what I'm going to say about it. Uh, you know, and, and I started thinking through that as well. And Jamie said, well, just tell him not to do it. And... Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and if they know someone who did, then don't help them bury the body. So that's why I thought, okay, well, sound advice from my wife. In the words of my buddy JV, she's not wrong. She's not wrong. So don't do those things. But 
the, uh, the, the, the command goes a little bit deeper uh, for us. And, and the Old Testament actually gives texture to what this command uh, says as well. If you look in the next chapter, if you want to go over to the next chapter in chapter 21, uh, verse 12 gives a little bit more texture to what it's talking about. It says in, uh, in verse, uh, verse 12 of chapter 21, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, it's not done, if it, is, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they have to flee to a place that I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. So, all throughout 21, we're going to see this a little bit later, uh, but throughout 21, there's a precedent that's established, and, and, and it's one that we can't miss, and that helps us to understand what's at the heart of this command. And the precedent is that life is precious, and it should be treated as such. Our lives should be treated as precious, and other people's lives should be treated as precious. Now, it, it's also important for us to understand what the command is is prohibiting, but also what it's not saying. The word that it uses in the Hebrew is the word murder. It's not, when, when it talks about kill, there's a different word in the Hebrew that's used for, uh, for that word and uh, for kill. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see the majority of the uses that come are with the word kill. And often the word kill is not a violation necessarily of the commandment do not murder. For instance, uh, when, there's, when there's a military uh, expedition or if there's some sort of going to war against the enemies of God, there the word that they use is kill and it's not murder. Or if you look in the next chapter, in chapter 22, it talks a little bit about self-defense there. And, and there the word that's used is you, you're, you can protect yourself when someone is trying to kill you. Uh, and, and that's not a violation of this idea, you shall not murder. So, so it's understanding here that we're talking about murder and homicide is really the, the command here not to commit homicide. But we need to also understand why this is, this is the case. Some of you say, well, it's obvious. The reason is because it's not a very nice thing to do. You're right. It's not a nice thing to do. But there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a greater rationale behind it. And that we see in Genesis 9, 6. So if you're taking notes or if you want to go there, you can. I think we'll have it here on the screen. But Genesis 9, 6 helps us to understand the rationale behind it. It says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. This gives us the reason behind the command of not murdering. It's because all people are created in the image of God. We've been created in the image, and that means we're, we have the likeness of God. To be created in the image of God is to be created in the likeness of God. And so we, have, we are like God in certain areas. In the fact that God is spirit, so we are also, we have a spirit. Uh, the, the, we are like God in that we, are, we have a likeness mentally. We, 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 have, uh, we have the ability to choose, and we are rational beings. We can make decisions. Uh, we have a likeness morally. We can reflect God's righteousness and his holiness. We have a, a, a likeness socially. Just as the Father is in fellowship with the Son and the Spirit and with us, we are also able to be in fellowship with other people. So we have that likeness and we have that, uh, we, we bear the stamp of God on us as well. And as such, we, the value of the image of God on us causes our lives to be very, very valuable. Over the years, it's been interesting how many people have tried to destroy different works of art in different museums. The Mona Lisa has actually been a targeted, or has, has been a target for many, many years. In 1956, uh, someone threw acid on the painting, and they actually damaged the lower part of the painting. And later that year, there was a vandal who came in and threw a rock at the painting. I don't know why, but they threw a rock. And it chipped off a little bit of, uh, of paint off of the, uh, the, the picture or the painting near the, near the elbow. In 1974, a woman sprayed red paint on the Mona Lisa. In 2009, a woman was angry with the museum, so she took a coffee mug and threw it at the painting. So uh, now today, it's actually protected with this bulletproof glass all around the Mona Lisa. They, because of the fact that it is 
priceless, it's precious, it's unique, and people are wanting to protect it from anybody from outside. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship. The better translation for workmanship is we are God's masterpiece. He views each one of us as precious, priceless, and unique. Psalm 139 says that God knit us together in our mother's womb. We bear the fingerprints of God himself, and to damage that has great consequence. And that's why you see in, in chapter 21 of Exodus, you saw what we just saw there in 12 through 17. But if you look throughout, all the way through verse 36, you have different parameters and, and, and restrictions put around certain things, and it's all to protect life. You have things like, well, if a roof were to cave in and someone were to die as a result, you know, what's to happen there? If a, if a bull were to escape and were to kill someone by accident, what were to happen there? If someone hurts someone else and they die, what should happen there? And all of these are kind of, they're, they're, they're to protect what is precious, what, is, what bears the image of God. It's protecting life. And some of these are, are kind of, they're, uh, they're, they're kind of more ancient examples. But we want to see some modern forms of murder as well. So uh, homicide is obviously in view here, but we're going to look at some things that are a little bit more controversial. And if you have any questions today about what we're talking about, any questions or any concerns uh, or anything, I wanted to give you my personal email. Uh, do we have, uh, just so that people can write it down, and if you have any questions, please be sure to contact uh, me. Do we, do we not have that? Okay, there we go. So any, if you have any questions at all. So as we, especially as we get into these controversial things, we... Uh, Please make sure to direct anything that way. And not to me personally here when we talk later. All right, so um, the, uh, the, first, the first modern form uh, of uh, besides homicide that I want to look at, and I want to look at three, and these are all joking aside, these are, these are kind of serious things. These are kind of, they're, they're difficult for us as well. So the first one that we need to examine a little bit more closely is, is uh, suicide. Suicide is a form of murder. It's taking one's own life. And it's important for us to remember that we are stewards of, uh, of the life that God has given us. It is not our own. We said before in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship. We are not our workmanship. There are five separate instances in the Old Testament that talk about uh, someone taking their own life. And they're, they're, in all these cases, they're not devout people, uh, but it's, they're all viewed negatively. Even when Jonah and Job, at different times, they also ask for God to take their life. They feel like life is not worth going on with. And God doesn't view their request favorably. So it's a choice. Suicide is a choice to remove one's own life. And I know that there's a lot of you here who know someone who has taken their life as well. We, we regularly hear about people who have committed suicide as well. And God has always said that he will provide a way out for people who are in that dire situation that doesn't require them violating his command. It is a form of murder. Suicide is a form of murder. Now, uh, some people have asked, and I get this question a lot, well, what if someone commits suicide? Are they going to hell? And the Bible does not say that you will. Uh, the, all these forms that we're talking about are sins, and they are serious, but the blood of Christ has made it possible that if you trust in Christ, he's not going to rip away that salvation if you commit any of these sins. So I think that's important for us to keep in mind as well. Second thing, second form that, it talk, that, that we need to look at is euthanasia. Uh, first time I heard that, I thought it was talking about Japanese teenagers, and it is not talking about Japanese teenagers. Euthanasia is a form of murder. Um, it's an ass it, euthanasia is assisted suicide, usually through medication. And this is done simply when people are done living, they're in a lot of pain, they might be in a hospital, and they're wanting to end their life, and they take treatment to end their life. Uh, euthanasia and assisted medication is different 
than uh, deciding to end treatment. Uh, the difference is that when you decide to end treatment that is unnaturally extending your life because, it's, because you're on life support or you're, or you're using medication to extend your life beyond what your life would be capable of, that's different than what we're talking about here. Euthanasia is taking treatment to try to bring an end to your life. And it's, a, it, it's assisted suicide is what, is what we talk about there. The final form, the third form that I want to look at is, a, is, is one that you might have guessed is abortion. Abortion is also a form of murder. Um, and unfortunately, it's become a hot topic. And a hot topic in the church as well. It has been for a while as well. Psalm 139, though, is clear that God knit us together in our, in our mother's womb. And there's different times in the Bible as well what talks about life in the womb. In, uh, in the Gospels, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth. Um, and, and, and John the Baptist, who was in the womb of Elizabeth at the time, left for joy when Mary came in. And, it, it, and the Bible speaks to these points. This, it, but beyond that, scientists on both sides of the issue argue or, or agree to the fact that from the moment of conception, there is a discernible human being with the blueprint of who that person will be in, in that in that person, in that embryo, at the moment of conception. So there's a discernible person who is there. There's a discernible life that bears the image from the moment of conception. Beyond that, Exodus 21. Let's go back to Exodus 21. And look what it says in verse 22 of Exodus 21. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely but there's no serious injury... The offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there's serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Life is precious even if it's in the womb. It's, God views it as precious and here he elevates it. He says if there's any damage in, to anything inside the womb as well, then you are also to take, uh, to, to, to punish in like, in like fashion, life for life. So it's elevating life within the womb, or maybe not elevating, but stating that life within the womb is the same as life outside of the womb. People today say, it's my body, it's my choice. If it's, it, it, it's simply not true. It doesn't extend. You can't take a gun and go commit homicide. You're not allowed to do that either. You may choose to do that, possibly, but it's not your right. And we are still gods. We are his workmanship. We are, his, we are stewards of the life he has given us. And so, therefore, we can't commit homicide. We can't damage or bring harm to people outside of the womb. You can't do it within the womb as well. And, and, and these are the different forms I want to focus, but there's many others that you can look at as well. So these are, these are kind of the parameters of this command. You have all these different, uh, th there's these different types of murder that are prohibited within this command. But let's look a little bit further because some of you might be saying, you know what, I'm, I'm okay still. These, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't deal with these. And to be sure, these are the more extreme uh, iterations and the extreme forms of this command. But Jesus helps us to understand and go a little bit further. And what I want to focus on now is a murder spectrum. There's a murder spectrum that Jesus puts us on or explains that exists that some of us might be on already. And we understand that there is, before you get to the extreme acts, there's things that happen beforehand. With the deacon, for instance, the deacon was on the murder spectrum long before he got to the act. Let's look in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, um, and this helps us to understand a little bit more fully what Jesus is talking about. Matthew 5, 21 through 22 says, You've heard it said uh, to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. The sixth commandment prohibits the violent act 
of murder. But here Jesus says that also the violent emotions and the intentions of the heart are just as sinful. Kevin DeYoung in his book, The Ten Commandments, writes, we can be 100% murder-free and still face the wrath of God if our lives are marked by anger, bitterness, insult, and rage. The Bible says you can be angry and not sin. But for most of us, that's not what happens. Most of the time, our anger manifests itself in the worst ways. And so I think it's a better thing to not try to be angry and not sin. I think it's better to just avoid anger altogether and to because of the fact that it spirals out of control so quickly. If we look at the first murder in Genesis chapter 4, Cain, uh, we see that, that that's what led him to murder, his anger and his malice that he did not control. And God even warns him of that in Genesis 4, 6, uh, 6 and 7. He said, the Lord says to Cain, he says, why are you angry? Why, are your, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right... Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it's desiring to have you, but you must master it. But he couldn't. Cain didn't master it and he became the first murderer. But it didn't start when he began plotting the murder. It started with his anger and his failure to control his anger. So what happens is that anger often goes towards contempt. And that's when we see insults and, and, and cruel statements that are made in, these, in, in this form. Contempt is when I, don't, when I say, I don't care, Dallas Willard writes, it's when I say, I don't care if I hurt you. I don't care about you one way or the other. At least that's what we say. Contempt makes it easy for us to hurt someone. Uh, it's, it, and, and to see them further degraded. The intent of contempt is always to exclude someone, to push them away, and to leave them isolated. What we're doing in contempt is that we are reducing the value of the person that we're insulting or that we're, that we're uh, criticizing. We reduce their value because if they're not as valuable, then it's easier to hurt them. It's easier to speak badly about them. It's easier to speak wrong about someone who is not priceless and someone who is not unique, someone who is not special because the creator has created them. And we reduce their value and we start to criticize them and we start to hurl insults in their way and that's how we hold them in contempt. Leaders do this all the time. Leaders in political circles constantly belittling, berating People who are, have opposing views. We see this in the business sector as well with, the, with, the, with, uh, with, with competition. Um, but we also see this in the church. We see this in the church when we're talking about different denominations. We see this in the church when we're talking about people who hold different views than we do. People who have different worship styles than we do. People who think differently about doctrine than we do who have still professed a faith in Christ and who are supposed to be our brothers and sisters in Christ, and yet we hurl insults and we hold them in contempt often. Jen Wilkin uh, has this fantastic uh, section in her book that I wanted to read a part for you here. It says, contempt may win followers, but it's not pastoral. It may make the point, but it always has a victim. We may deflect our connection to the victims and ask, as Cain did, am I my brother's keeper? This is what God asked Cain after Abel, after he had murdered Abel. Uh, he asked Cain, he, he said, where's your brother Abel? Cain says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it really for me to know that? And she continues right here. She says, the, but the but the." Blood-bought children of God know the answer to this question because Christ, our brother, has answered this question fully and finally with, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Jesus was the object of anger and contempt, stripped of his dignity, enduring the breaking of the sixth commandment in his broken flesh and spilled blood. Cain, the murderer, was not Messiah. Christ, the murdered, is Messiah indeed. He is the image of the invisible God, and he whose life was extinguished took every care to preserve 
life. And in receiving back his own life, he lives that we may have life. Let me, let me, let me digest this for you. God is the creator of life. God is the originator of life. And from Genesis 3, when we, because of our sin, earn death, which is eternal separation from God, God has been working from the beginning to restore life for us. And then when Jesus came, he says, listen, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. And then he offers eternal life. So God is working 24-7 to bring about life. And he says, listen, when you are on the murder spectrum, not only are you living in sin, but you're working against my mission. You're working against me. When you're harboring that anger and that bitterness and that resentment, and when, you're, when you have contempt against someone else, you're working against my mission that I am always working for to bring life. God says, don't be working against me. Nip it in the bud. There's an old story uh, about a German man who was visiting uh, Guatemala for a vacation. And after, uh, he was, after his vacation was over, he got back on a boat. This was many years ago. Uh, he got back on a boat to go back to Europe, and while he was on the boat, he noticed uh, there was a pain in his left toe, and he took off his shoe, looked inside, and there was a, on, in his big toe, there was a little tick that is found in Central America called the nigua. And so he, he looked at it, he's like, you know what? Nobody in Germany has ever seen a nigua, so I'm going to leave that in there, and when I get home, I'm going to show them this little tick. Uh, weird. But anyway, so... He gets back home, he visits with his friends and family, shows them this little nigua. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for showing us this. And he was about to remove it, simple thing. Uh, but they said, uh, you know what, we have relatives that are coming next week. Would you mind if we just leave it in there for this week and then we'll, and then we'll show them and then you can take it off? He said, that's totally fine course. Why not? So he leaves it in there. By the time the relatives came, he now had a little family of niguas that were there in his toe, and he was limping a little bit now, uh, and, and he, he showed them this, uh, this little tick. They oohed and awed. Amazing. Thank you so much for leaving this in and showing us this tick. Uh, so he then removed it, got these out, and that was the end of the story. Except it wasn't, right? So he goes to the doctor, and the doctor looks, and he says, you know what, there's an, inspe there's an infection there. Because he, was, he had felt that pain. He said, there's an infection. We're not only going to have to take the toe, we're going to have to take the foot. And he, upon further examination, he said, actually, I'm sorry. It's actually going to be the leg. And because of not removing this little tick that was easy to remove, it would have been simple, he got to the place where he actually lost his whole leg because of it. Because of allowing this little thing to thrive in his life, it actually became a threat to his life because he didn't nip it in the bud. And that's where it starts. It starts with anger. It starts with bitterness. Malicious thoughts form, and that leads to malice and torture and aggression and abuse, assault, and so many other violent offenses that are all on the murder spectrum. It starts long before that. So, we've talked about the parameters, and we've understood a little bit more about the murder spectrum, and we've seen a little bit about how we can be on this and working against what God is doing. So I want to just spend the last, our last few minutes here talking about the response. What should be our response to what we're reading here and to this command? Don't murder is actually talking about a lot more than what we, what we originally thought. So I want to give you three ways in which we can respond to this. The first is to repent. In Matthew 5, if you look beyond where we read, Jesus says, listen, if you're about to worship, if you're about to offer sacrifices and you find out that someone has something against you or you have something against someone else, you go and you, uh, you make peace with them. It's not usually the way it goes for us. Usually what we do is we are passive aggressive. And we maintain our anger and we wait until they know that we're upset 
and they come to us. Make them come to us. Here, that's not what it says. It says if you are offended or they have an offense, you go. If you know about something, you go. Most people say, well, they're just not going to receive that well. Yeah, well, that, that, that's not, it doesn't say anything about receiving it well. It just says go. Go and make peace. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone is what the Bible tells us. It doesn't really leave it up to a discussion. You need to go and then you repent. You repent of your anger. You repent of your bitterness. You repent of, your, uh, of any malice that you felt, any contempt towards that person. But it is up to us to go and to make peace. So the first, first thing we can do is repent. Second thing we can do is to preserve life. Christians should be the most adamant about uh, preserving life. Since we believe that God formed each person and that we all bear the image of God, we should be the ones who are seeking to preserve it and to protect it. And that means uh, we, we, we champion life. We seek to get involved with different ministries that are championing life, like Metroplex Women's Clinic or other pregnancy centers that are helping to preserve the life of unborn children and seeking to do what we can there. It also means getting involved with ministries like Traffic 911 or, uh, or, or the Hope Zone, where we were just at uh, with, with our students or different ministries that are trying to rescue people out of a life of addiction or a life of, uh, well, a life of being trafficked as well. There are people who are being trafficked and trying to rescue people from these different, uh, from these different places where people are trying to ruin their lives. So these are ways that we can do as well to preserve life. So we need to repent, we need to preserve life, but we also want to give life. We want to try to give life. You know the top two lifestyle factors that actually extend life expectancy? The Public Library of, of Science Medical Journal surveyed 300,000 people over nearly a decade, gathered data from 148 independent studies, and they found that it's not diet, it's not exercise, it's not giving up smoking, and it's not giving up alcohol, but rather social interaction and support are the two things that actually enhance and extend life. So, let me explain that. S social interaction, aka community. Being in community with other people actually extends our lives. If that's not a plug for community group, I don't know what is. Some of you are like, well, I don't know if I want my life extended. Well, worry about that later. But this will enhance your life as well. All right, so social interaction, community, and support. Encouraging, loving, kindness to people actually also enhances and it extends our life expectancy. So when we're in community and when we're helping to love other people, in short, if we act more like Jesus then God actually extends our life and enhances it. Who would have thought, right, that God would be doing this? But he actually biologically, medically, scientifically proven that God will do that with people when they're more Christ-like. He actually enhances life because that's who God is. He is a life-giving God. And when we participate in the life-giving activity of living like Christ, he actually enhances and extends life. I shared with you a couple sermons ago that my dad and I had reconciled after a year of not speaking with each other. And during that year, we struggled. It was a difficult time for both of us. And I, I struggled physically. It, it actually physically took a toll on me. And a friend of mine, a good friend of both of ours, actually told us at one point, he was like, you're killing yourselves. You're, you, you are, you, you're killing yourselves. And I, and I thought he meant emotionally. I thought he meant emotionally, but I think he knew about what this study was saying because something else that this study found was that holding on to grudges and anger actually shorten your life. It's, it, 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 when the study found that long-term stress damages your body by keeping it in a heightened state of alert for extended period of time. It's like driving down I-30 going 70 miles an hour in first or second gear. The engine just can't sustain it, and it breaks down after, after a certain period of time. And our bodies were not meant to live on the murder spectrum. 
We were not meant to live there. We were not meant to be constantly harboring anger and bitterness and to, and to, and to give ourselves opportunity for that to uh, spiral out of control. Instead, God says, I want you to live over here. I want you to love one another as you love yourselves. I want you to uh, show kindness. I want you to be in community. I want you to experience these things. And as we do, we come to know and be in fellowship better with God, but also it enhances our life and the lives of others around us. God is working 24-7 to bring life. And the best thing that I can say for those of you as well is that uh, who, who haven't trusted Christ is that God is extending an offer for life today. He says, if you have not trusted in me, then you are spiraling towards a separation, an eternal separation. And he says, I have made it possible if you trust in Christ. Here's what Jesus did. He went and he died on the cross. And when he rose from the grave, he proved once and for all that he was stronger than death. That he really can bring life to anybody because death couldn't hold him. And so when we put our trust in Jesus as our Savior, believing that he died for our sins and that he rose from the grave, God says, then at that moment, you receive eternal life. And if that's your desire today, I'm going to pray right now, and I'm going to ask for you to pray with me. If that's the desire, you say, God, I want that gift of eternal life. I believe you're a life-giving God, and I need that. Then pray with me. And if you're as well here, and you say, you know what, I need to, I need to confess. I'm on that spectrum. I've got anger. I haven't, I haven't talked to whoever for months or for years. And I've had a grudge in my heart. And I'm harboring bitterness. And I need to go resolve that. If that's you, pray as well. And let's do business with the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you because of the fact that you are at work, even through three simple words, we understand better how, how you feel about life and how you value life, and how you value the life that you've given us. God, would you help us if we are angry, if we are bitter, if we have resentment towards someone, would you help us to, uh, to go and to make peace or to do our best to make peace? Would you bring that about so that we can enjoy that life that you've given us? And God, if there's, if there's someone here who says, you know what, I want the gift of eternal life, would you pray with me now? Dear God, I recognize, I believe I'm a sinner. And I don't know how to get that life that you are speaking of other than what we're talking about now. And so I trust in Jesus as my Savior. I believe he died on the cross and that he rose again. And I want the eternal life, the gift that you extend to each one of us you be my savior. I want to follow you. I want to seek after you. In Jesus' name.